My name is John Weber, and I'm the regional executive for Zenith Insurance. I'm here in Bradenton, Florida, and my virtual background is a photo of our, our regional building in downtown Sarasota. Uh, we're all still working from home, but uh, very anxious to get back into the office soon. And I, I feel very fortunate to be here with all of you today, uh, and on behalf of our Zenith team to be today's sponsor and have the opportunity to partner with Tommy to introduce a very special heart-led leader, Lee Cockrell. I was able to listen to Tommy Spaulding uh, earlier this month as he kicked off the series and gave us all a preview of the heart-led speaker lineup. And, and I couldn't have been more impressed and just really anxious for it to begin. Beth, I'd like to thank you and the entire Florida CMAA organization. You have been ex extraordinary partners. Uh, you've given us this opportunity, but truly you've been a partner and a trusted resource for all of us uh, at Zenith and, and allowing us to be that for your member clubs. It's been, it's been fantastic. Uh, you know, at Zenith, we do one thing and we strive to, to do it every day and to try and get better at it every day. And that's to provide workers' compensation insurance. Uh, I firmly believe that we do do it better than anyone else in the industry. And I've been with the company for 25 years and we have consistently delivered the lowest loss ratios in the industry. And we insure more country clubs than anyone else. And we're very proud of that. Like everyone, we've had to adjust how we do things during this pandemic. And I'm very proud of the service and the value that we continue to deliver. We are one of the few carriers, I believe, who has continued to deliver loss control services. So we send consultants out to country clubs to help you with your, with your safety programs and to answer questions and be there uh, to support you. Uh, we insure many types of businesses and I know everybody's had to change a little bit, but I can't think of an industry that has done a better job at adapting to the environment, to this ever-changing environment and to delivering world-class service to your members than the country club industry. And as I thought about that, I, I attribute that to obviously the many strong leaders that you have. You have a very collegial approach as you work with one another and share ideas and information. And then again, you have that relentless focus to deliver a superior experience. And then of course, you've got the support of Beth and the association behind you. And, and with all of that, over this period of time, you've continued to bring the magic. And that does lead me to today's speaker, Lee Cockrell. I'm sure you've all seen the bio. Uh, as a former executive of Disney, he and thousands of cast members delivered magic every single day. And uh, Tommy's gonna do a, a, a very thorough introduction. And he was the one along with Beth who's made this happen. So it's my honor, Tommy, to, to turn it over to you. Uh, it looks like in sunny and, and warm Denver, Colorado, to introduce to introduce Lee today. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, John Weber, um, with Zenith for um, sponsoring this and, and our friendship with you. And um, thank you so much for being here today, Beth and the board of Florida Club Mountain Association. Good morning, and thank you so much for sponsoring this amazing series. And for those that are new on the call. Um, the vision of this series is, you know, how do you become a heart-led leader? Like, how do you really build a culture uh, within your club of, of servant leadership? And so over the next seven months, we have nine different speakers that are going to come in um, and really teach us that. And today's our, our second of our nine speakers, and it's a dear friend of mine, Lee Cockrell. And just let me get the, the bio out of the way. Lee has got an impressive, impressive resume. Um, he spent 17 years at Marriott. He spent eight years with Hilton and then the last 16 years of his career um, at Disney. And 10 of those 16 years, he was the executive vice president and really in charge of all operations for, for Disney. And with that position, I'll just read it real quick. He had 20 resort hotels, 24,000 guest rooms, four theme parks, two water parks, five golf courses, 40,000 employees, and a partridge in a pear tree. I mean, that's just an impressive um, resume. Um, but what I love about Lee, and when I talked to him a couple of days ago, prepping for this call, and I told Lee when I fell in love with him, it was when we invited him to Denver about 15 years ago to speak to our youth program, the, the National Leadership Academy. We had a fundraiser, and Lee was our keynote speaker, and everyone was there to, to, to hear Lee about you know, creating magic and his 
um, you know, how he, you know, he was basically the number two guy in Walt Disney and, and everyone wanted to hear all the Disney stories, which he did and he did so well. But then he got personal and, and he got vulnerable and he talked a lot about mental health and his challenge with that. And I just fell in love with him because most executives at that level aren't, aren't that vulnerable and you'll see that human side of him. And um, unfortunately, the, the more success you have in life, um, the more positional authority, the more power you have, um, the more arrogant and cocky you become. And Lee is just the opposite of that. Um, the more success that he's had through his career, the more genuine and humble he has. And now he's a full-time teacher and he's a mentor of mine. And one of the things I love about Lee is his love for young people. And I'm not sure how long ago it was Lee, but maybe six or seven years ago, I found uh, a person in my life that had a daughter that was dying of a cancer, a young girl. She was dying of cancer and her one dream was to go to Disney. And I called Lee up and not only to make that happen, but that young girl slept in the palace at, um, in Disney and um, had an incredible experience. And Lee just does those things to help and bless people. Um, so Lee, thank you so much for being our second of nine speakers about heart-led leadership. Uh, thank you for writing this great book, Creating Magic, and teaching us today about how do we create magic in the clubs throughout Florida. Wow. All righty. Well, thank you, uh, Tommy. I'm sorry my wife didn't hear that introduction. That would have been perfect. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I've known Beth forever, not ever, but 18, 20 years now, and it's good to be back. I, I spoke to this group, uh, all of you, uh, some of you might have been there a few years ago, and, and uh, I uh, really look forward to talking about being a teacher and uh, helping people understand how they can be better. And the uh, uh, thing I want to start out with today is to talk to you about how important time is. Uh, Beth mentioned to me earlier before we came on that she remembers me always having my day planner, my day timer, day planner in my pocket. And I said, well, I still do. And I will tell you, uh, one of the things you really need to take seriously is uh, how you spend your time. Uh, I mean, it, at the end of the day, uh, actually, I could say there's one more thing that's more important, and that's how you make decisions, <laughs> that you make good decisions. But the second one is really how you spend your time, because your success in your life is going to be directly related to how you spend your time, uh, where you spend it, where you don't spend it, where you should be spending it, and asking yourself why you're not spending it in those key places that can really enrich your uh, your whole life. Uh, and it's not about time management. It's about how do you keep your whole life under control? And uh, to talk to you about that today, I've been teaching time management for more than 35 years. I would say that my success, and I can tell you, I grew up in Oklahoma. I don't have a college degree. My mother was married five times. I were, we were very poor on a farm. Um, I've been adopted twice. I got my name Cockrell when I was 16 by husband number four. I didn't get, I went to college, but flunked out because I forgot to go to class, but I had a great time. And then I went in the army. And so I've been there, I've seen it, I know how important it is. And people say, well, how are you so successful with no college degree and all of that dysfunctional family life? And I said, there's two things I have that if you have them, you will be successful. One, I have a good attitude. Um, and if you don't have a college degree, it's even more important probably to have a good attitude because people then want to help you. And uh, second thing is I'm uh, very organized. I'm very reliable. I'm credible. I uh, keep my promises. I do what I say I'm going to do. And I use this day planner to remind me to do what I should be doing and to make sure I do it when I commit to it. And so uh, you all may want to take a hard look at time management uh, and uh, really learn how to do it. A lot of people think that uh, you're just born disorganized, and that's that's not even close to true. It's learning that about time management is like taking any course, math or marketing or sales or uh, anything you want to learn to do, cooking. Uh, this is a learned process, and you can learn how to do it, and you can get better at it, and it'll make a significant difference in your life. So at Disney World, uh, <clears throat> uh, People used to ask me what I did at Disney, and I said, really, really not much. I just made sure things got done. Uh, I had all the technical people around me. I had a chefs, and I had uh, uh, security and transportation people, retail. I had people who ran uh, all those businesses. And so when I 
realize that I've got all the technical people, I've got all the really smart people that know what they're doing, then I have to decide what am I going to do with my time? I don't need to be spending in, in food and beverage or retail, or I need to be spent, figure out where do I spend my time to make a difference for everybody in the organization since I was the senior person in charge of all of this. And I spent my time in three areas. Uh, one, making sure we were hiring the right people. Let me tell you what, there is nothing, nothing more important than who you hire and who you bring into your organization. And if you don't get better at that, and take more time at it and uh, be really particular about who you bring in. Uh, you can never be as successful as you could be with talent. And I took a lot of time to hire people and Disney still today, we always do. We really, even today, if you wanna, uh, if you want to uh, join Disney, you have to go on the internet and answer about 136 questions about yourself. It's a profiling system we worked with Gallup on. Uh, it's very, uh, uh, accurate uh, and if you get through it uh, and the reason we do that is we want to know a lot about you do you have discipline are you going to be to work on time are you going to do what how you, are you going to follow the policies procedures operating guidelines rules uh, we want to know if you have that uh, spirit of serving can you set, can you sell an ice cream cone all day long at 95 degrees outside and guests are unhappy and it's raining and you still be really great Creating magic is hard, and it's an, about an attitude. Uh, everything matters, and, and, and you've got to really always stay uh, cheerful and uh, friendly. That's what we do at Disney. And so when that profile is over, if you pass it, you get to go to the casting center, fill out an application. But before, when I was there, you had to watch a film about Disney expectations for working at Disney. And it was about being to work on time, attitude, uh, all, everything to do with hospitality, uh, what you can do and can't do, no visible tattoos, no visible piercings. You can have them, just they can't be visible. As we laugh, we say, Cinderella can't have a tattoo on her neck and Mickey can't smoke while he talks to your kids. We're putting on a show. So we have to be clear about all that. Well, when that film was over, about 20 to 25% of the applicants decide not to work for Disney. And that is because they don't like what they heard about the expectations for working there. And, you know, expect clarif clarifying expectations is probably one of the mo most important things you can do is be clear. And then people can decide if they want to work with you, work for you, work uh, in your organization. Uh, clarity is probably the biggest problem we have in all relationships, whether it's marriage, kids, not being clear about your expectations and, uh, and uh, when you do that, and the main reason people are not clear is it's hard. It's hard to be clear. It's hard to, you know, actually people don't like to do hard things. That's the biggest problem we have in life. People don't like to do the hard things because they're hard. So we put them off. And I guarantee you, everybody listening to this today has one, two, three, maybe problems in their life. They've been avoiding, putting off for years that they need to take care of. And I would suggest to anybody listening today that, you know, starting next week, you ought to pick one of those. It's really, you know, you've been putting it off. You know, you could be better. You know, if you dealt with it and start working on it, it may take you a month to get rid of it. It may take you a year. I don't know. Uh, you may need help to get rid of it. You may need training to get rid of it. You may need uh, a counselor. Who knows what it is, but get those hard things out of your life because they affect your sleep, they affect your personality, they affect the way you feel, uh, they affect your relationships. And so that's the way to think about that. So that's what we do well, we, uh, we really hire well. And the second half of hiring people, right, is you've got to do the other hard thing, which is get rid of the people that are not wanting to be excellent. People that are not living up to the standards you have. Uh, the reputation you want to have, the level of excellence you want to have. You've got to deal with these people. And I know right now, if you're listening, you've got people in your organization and you know who they are and you're not dealing with them. And they, you need to either have a talk and get them turned around or they need to move on to some other club, <laughs> some other uh, uh, kind of work. And um, so uh, do the hard things and you're going to get great results. So uh, the second th place I spent my time is training. 
training, make sure time on training. Let me tell you, uh, there's only two things parents worry about in life, and that's safety and education. And that's what you should be worrying about with your staffs, safety and education, training. And train your people, make sure you're training them. Uh, and you got to ask yourself, are you training them as well as you could, as well as you should? Uh, are you training them not only in the technical part of their job? You know, sure. You, a lot of times you don't have to. A chef knows how to cook. You don't need to train them usually for that. You may have to train a new waiter. You may have to train a new cashier. You may have to train a, whatever the person is. But are you training them in behaviors, expected behaviors, how you conduct yourself, professionalism, how you speak to people, not telling inappropriate jokes, sexual harassment issues. Are you making sure people have total clarity, not only on their technical part of their job or how to do it, but how to behave and how to be professional and be very clear about that up front. And when you do that, you have a lot less problems, less lawsuits, uh, less accidents, uh, less uh, workman's compensation claims. Uh, Training is really, it's the magic pill of uh, you take a great person and train them. And it's amazing what happens. You can really sit back yourself and uh, feel comfortable. Things are going to happen when you're not even there because you've got people who are committed. You've hired committed people who want to do a great job and they'll do it whether you're at work or not. Third place I spent my time is culture making sure that we were creating a culture where everybody matters and they know they matter. And in our business, there's a lot of us that do a good job with that. And there's a lot of us that don't do a good job with that, where everybody matters, where everybody wakes up in the morning, wants to come to work, not have to come uh, because of the way they're treated and included, involved, listened to, their opinion counts, uh, uh, they get training, they get development, uh, they know they can get ahead in life. They're inspired when they wake up because they see the possibilities because of the culture they live and work in. And let me tell you what, uh, having a culture where everybody matters and they know they matter, uh, the best way to do that, and all of you can do it, it doesn't cost one penny, is to tell them. Make sure you're having that opportunity to eventually, during the week, touch every one of your people, telling them how much you appreciate it. I don't care if they're cleaning the bathrooms, landscaping, uh, parking the cars, cooking, washing the dishes, or it's one of your managers or executives. Everybody matters. If they didn't matter, you wouldn't have them on the payroll anyway. And they do matter, and everything comes together at the end to take care of the customer and uh, the guests that you serve every day. And uh, so this is one that uh, we've got a long way to go in America and around the world of showing respect for everybody. You just let me tell you, stopping somebody in the hall and tell them how great they are and you haven't seen them for a while and how much you appreciate them and you're glad that you're there on the team and you hope they stay, uh, you made their day and their performance will go up, uh, their commitment to the organization will go up, their... Uh, their pride will go up, turnover will go down because we all wanna be in a place where we are appreciated, where we matter. Everybody wants to matter. And uh, sometimes people got a bad attitude, they still wanna matter. A lot of people are insecure. They need to have that kind of support. Uh, and so I guarantee you, your finance people will like it because it costs nothing. And that's cost nothing to make sure people know they matter. As my wife said many years ago, she said, Lee, if you love me, tell me. Don't keep it to yourself. And I would say the same thing for your people. If you respect your people, make sure you find ways to tell them. Just a short comment, a note, uh, uh, any, there's a million ways for you to, uh, to uh, show appreciation, recognition, and encouragement to everybody. And it may be one of your most important jobs. If you're a parent, you already know that. Uh, parents' main job is to build uh, self-confidence and uh, a belief, people have believed in themselves. And parents do it all the time. Moms and dads tell their kids they love them every day. They uh, show a million times when their kids do something well, they take that time to tell them, good job, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, when they don't do a good job, we say, well, good job, but let's try it again. You can do that better. Let me show you how. Uh, we always look for that opportunity to build self-esteem, self-confidence, and a belief in children, because we know how important it is. 
And by the way, it's just as important in the workplace because if you work in a good culture, you will become better. You will become better. I don't care who you are. And if you work in a bad culture where people don't treat people fairly and there's discrimination and bigotry and uh, sexual harassment and inappropriate jokes and uh, all of those kinds of things, people will, even good people that join your company will fall into the trap of becoming that way too, it, to some point. Uh, so don't, un, don't, don't um, underestimate how important your culture is. As they say, culture is not part of the game, it is the game. You get the culture right, everything else works well. When you get all the people in your organization wake up in the morning and can't wait to come to work and do their jobs and be proud of what they do and, and be recognized for it, and uh, you'll have an amazing organization that will be, you'll have competitive advantage over anybody. And you'll attract better people, by the way, too, because the word gets out in your community what it's like to work in your organization. And when people hear about a great culture and a great place and great opportunity and great training and great development, they want to be there. They will be there. Your good, your good staffs will bring other good people from their neighborhood, from their friends. And uh, you will have less and less problems recruiting and keeping people because we all want to be in a, in a culture, whether it's at home or at work or in a club where, uh, we feel like we're somebody. You already know your customers want that. You know your guests and your country clubs and members, they want to matter. And I'm sure you have to work hard to make sure you're making them matter because a lot of them are difficult and uh, they're difficult to deal with, but you've got to uh, make them feel special. You've got to treat them as individuals. You've got to show respect to them. And, uh, and you got to do the same for your people, for the people who work with you and work for you. Uh, the guest and uh, your staff want exactly the same thing. And because uh, that's, we all do. All humans want the same thing. They want to be appreciated and they want to matter. So think deeply about how well you're doing that as you walk your operation every day, as you meet with people, as you give clarity on expectations. Uh, make sure people know when you hire them, if they're doing something great, you're going to let them know. And if they're not doing something great, you're going to let them know. And uh, it's about honesty. Just I always say, manage like a mother. Mothers, uh, mothers have two things every leader needs to have. They have empathy and they have discipline. Let me tell you why. And uh, I don't know about your mother, but my mother was a terrorist before they had him in the world. She had empathy and she had discipline and she used both of them on my brother and I. Uh, there was a time when she, we knew she loved us because she told us and um, we knew that if we messed up, she was going to uh, be right there uh, making sure because what she was doing was disciplining the eight year old when I was eight or nine or 10. She was disciplining me because of how she wanted me to be as a 25 year old, a 30 year old, a 35 year old, a father. And uh, that's why you do it. Uh, that's why mothers do it. They can't not do it. Uh, they love you so much that they want you to be successful. And the mothers don't care if you're happy every day. <laughs> they care if you're successful. So you'll get uh, a, I love you in the morning and you may get your little rear end kicked uh, with some discipline in the afternoon. And that's how life is. You know, I don't care how old mothers get. They, they'll be telling you what to do when you're 70 and they're 90 because they care. And if you care, you will do this more. You will find ways to do this. And all of a sudden, you will have less problems in your organization. You'll have less guest complaints because everybody's going to be doing a great job. You won't have to call a guest and apologize for a rude, rude employee. You won't have to call and apologize for mistakes that are made or it, all those kinds of things. When you do the right things, a lot of things never, a lot of bad things don't happen. And so that's how I spent my time. I, I kind of call that the formula of hire them right, train them right, and treat them right. And if you think about those three things and kind of write those down and under each one of them, think about how am I going to get better at this? How am I going to get better at having a better team? Hire them right. Then how am I going to train them better? Am I going to be more clear? Am I going to be more honest? Am I going to make sure people, the minute I see some poor performance, I step over there and correct it just like your mother would. And uh, how am I going to have a culture where I they feel safe, they feel appreciated, they feel like they can be somebody, 
And a lot of those people that you build their self-confidence with a good culture will be some of your best managers one day. They'll be some of your best employees. They'll be some of your best people because they will come along. And uh, we're all lucky who we run into in our lives, who are who mentors we have, who takes us by the hand and shows us, you know, starting out with our mothers and then having the right people, the right teachers that care about us and then having the right employer. Uh, when I started with Hilton right out of uh, ar the army, I had a guy who took me by the hand, one of the banquet captains, and he showed me the business. He taught me the business and he cared about me for some reason. And I think he cared about me because I had a good attitude. I was very uh, capable of doing whatever he asked. Uh, I didn't complain. I showed up on time. And uh, he, because of my good attitude, he took me by the hand and started teaching me how to do things because I knew nothing. I didn't know one single thing. I'd never even been in a hotel before. I just accidentally fell into this job. And uh, so you think about it. If I hadn't had him, I had another person in my career who took me and helped me to be less defensive. I was a very defensive young man because of how I grew up and not having a college degree and insecure. And he, he, he worked with me. Every time I became defensive, he said, Lee, stop it. This is not about you. This is about the business problem we're discussing. Don't try to be, take it personally. It, I'm just trying to work with you. One day he told me, Lee, the whole world does not revolve around Lee Cockrell. Get over your insecurity and problem and start just focusing on the business and the work. And uh, he, he drove that, in, that defensiveness out of me, that insecurity. I still have it, but he helped me get better at it and be better at handling it. And uh, that defensiveness can affect your marriage. It can affect your relationship with your kids, other people. Uh, people don't like to work with defensive people that always have an excuse and blame it on somebody else. So the key people around you, you can be that key mentor for somebody and you ought to try to do that for as many people as you can. And, and you also can find those mentors. And when you have a good attitude and you're organized and you're reliable and you're credible to do everything you're supposed to do, you're going to have people that want to mentor you and they want to promote you and they want you to have a better career and a better life. And so that's where I spent my time, those three areas. And you can think about every day how you spend your time. Are you spending it in the right place? And uh, start really digging down deep. In time management, you know, the way you do it is some people say, well, how do you decide what to put in your day planner? I say, well, every morning I open my planner and there it says to do today. And I take five or 10 minutes. And first I think about yesterday, what I didn't do as well as I should have. That member I ran into and I gave him an answer, but I thought of something better that I should pay to him. I'm gonna call him back this morning. Or that employee I sat down and coached and counseled yesterday, but I didn't, I wasn't clear enough and I need to go back to them today. Always reflect on yesterday every day. Put your, just take your mind and go through your day yesterday and think about, is there anything I could have done better yesterday? I could have been more clear on something I want to do better in the future and go back and fix yesterday before you start the day. Because you will fix it most times before the people even realize that it could have been better. And uh, reflection is a powerful thing because when you reflect on things, you do it better the next time it happens, next time it comes up because your brain has uh, thought about it and thought about it like I could, I even do it, you know, I, so I got a better relationship, my wife and I, we've been married 53 years. And every time I thought about how I could have said that better, why did I say it that way? Why did I say that to her? And I went back and we talked about it and apologized. And now I have more restraint. I don't say things that I'm going to be sorry for. There's no upside to making somebody feel bad. There's no upside to aggravating people. Uh, and I always tell people, if you think there's an upside to aggravating people, try it on your wife. You'll find out that's not going to work out very well. There's just no upside. And it's usually you, not, not them. It's an insecurity. Anybody that treats you badly, has a bad attitude, doesn't uh, show you appreciation, uh, raises their voice to you, tries to intimidate you, makes you feel small. That's a person with a, a security, individual security problems. Uh, they have a self-confidence problem, and I've seen it my whole career, and uh, uh, it's a good way to spot it. And not that you need to do something bad to those people, but you need to understand that's what their problem is. And you can be the one to help start building their self-confidence, their self-esteem, and uh, showing them the way. And uh, being that person who uh, gets that, turn, that attitude turned around so they can have a better career, too, which will help your business. So... 
Other things I talk about uh, uh, in time management is after you do that, you think about the responsibilities you signed up for in your life. Every one of you listen has a different list. Depends who you are, where you are in your life. Um, you know, we, we you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, a spouse, uh, whatever. That's a responsibility. You signed up for it. And you need to think about every day when you're doing your little 5, 10, 15 minute planning time before you start your day. Is there anything you need to do for them today? It could be a simple thing as leaving your wife a note on the desk. I, I love you. It could be a, a little simple thing of making a reservation for dinner for Friday night and telling her we're going to go out or picking up a card today or, or uh, saying, reminding her we need to have a conversation Saturday about the kids or what do you need to do? Think about her. Then think about your children if you have children. What do you need to do for them? Do you need to get them signed up for camp next June because it might get sold out? Do you need to buy an airline ticket for them? Do you need to uh, go up to the school and see their teachers? Schedule that time. Go up and talk to the teachers about how they're doing and create that relationship with the teachers so your kids get more attention. You need to talk to them about the birds and the bees when they're nine or 10 years old. And that's a serious conversation. And you, you have it every year gradually uh, as it gets a, a stronger conversation about it. Uh, you need to talk to them about ethics and honesty and uh, those kinds of things. There's a lot of things we need to do for our kids every day. Read to them when they're little at night before they go to bed, uh, check their homework, uh, make sure they know you care about them. Uh, third, you got uh, other responsibilities, your own career. What courses are you going to take this year? What are you going to sign up for? You're going to go out and get your undergraduate degree or go back and get your master's degree or MBA, or are you going to take some courses online, which they're all available now? Uh, you could listen to my podcast. It's called Creating Disney Magic. It's free. It's on iTunes. It's 15 minutes every Tuesday on leadership management and customer service. It, uh, there's 350 episodes on there about every subject from uh, how to hire to how to fire to how to treat people better. There's one on there about anxiety and depression. I, Tommy said in my introduction, yeah, I went through some anxiety and depression that was pretty serious. I've never been depressed a day in my life. My wife got sick and almost died a few years ago. I had to take care of her for two years. Uh, she was in the hospital 64 days. The bill was $700,000. Luckily, I still had Disney insurance. And um, I ended up with anxiety, and then it went, became depression. And I was pretty much didn't do anything for a couple of years. I ended up going to see a psychiatrist, getting put on medication. I saw a psychologist. I saw an acupuncturist. I, I exercised every day to try to get out of that way I felt. I quit watching violent TV. I listened to music at night and read. I uh, took caffeine and alcohol out of my diet because that, that affects anxiety and leads to depression. I mean, I did everything I could do. I canceled all my work for a year because I could not get up in front of an audience. I was so uh, bothered by the anxiety and I wasn't sleeping. And I put, there's two uh, episodes, uh, I think, they're in March of 2016 on the podcast that you can listen to about what happened to me. I was 65 when it happened, never been depressed a day in my life. And you just don't know what can trigger it for you. Business things don't trigger that to me. It's personal things. My wife, my son, my grandchildren, my daughter-in-law, those kinds of things that uh, really hit me hard. And it has a lot to do, the psychiatrist told me, the way I grew up and uh, got all that stuff that uh, you're, let me, let me, one thing I know for sure, half the stuff in your brain is not true. And um, uh, you got to kind of sort out what's up there. Some of the stuff in your brain you don't even know is there and it causes you to overreact. It could have happened when you were two years old, could have happened when you were in grade school, kindergarten, it could have happened. Who knows what develops our attitudes. But you got to think about your deepest beliefs and try to get over them because uh, if they're not accurate, they're not correct and get help. Go for help. Like today, I, 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 even when I worked Disney, I had everybody doing everything. I didn't do much, but today I have a, I have a marketing guy who works for me. I have a, a website person. I have an accountant. I have uh, a trainer. My wife and I have training. We, we do strength, agility, and balance training twice a week. Now we do it online with him. He comes on on his phone. And we do it together because we don't want to fall and break a hip. 
Uh, we have, uh, you know, we got a lot of people helping us stay healthy. A lot of doctors, a lot of uh, working out, a lot of eating right. Uh, people who advise us on uh, all of that stuff. I told Beth earlier, I'm 77 now. I'm in that ozone. That ozone is the obituary zone. And 77 is a, a good candidate for that. So I'm more careful to make sure I'm uh, looking after myself, taking care of myself. And uh, the three ways you do that is make sure you're getting enough sleep, enough uh, 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 diet and uh, exercise. That's the three ways. I mean, if you're not participating in those three at a pretty high level, you're going to... Uh, have issues. And um, so um, it's just uh, dealing with reality. Don't uh, blow it off. And number one reason people don't exercise, it's hard. <laughs> There's no other reason. Lack of self-discipline. And as I said, mothers have uh, empathy and discipline. And when you get discipline, you will start to do the things you should do. It seems like everybody's got time to do what they want, but not what they should do. And exercise is one of those things that you don't do when you get a chance. You schedule it, schedule the priorities in your life, put them in your day planner. Uh, those other responsibilities you should have in your day planner, your mom and dad, your grandparents are going to get older. You're going to have to help them. You should have in those conversations now how they want things handled. Do you have the will signed before dementia might set in? Uh, your own finances, make sure you go talk to somebody about your retirement and you've got it on track and you understand it clearly and uh, all the things, you don't have to be an expert in anything, but you, you got to make sure you have experts that help you. Uh, my trainer helps me do what I would not do. Tomorrow morning, I have it at uh, eight o'clock and if I didn't have it scheduled with him, I probably would blow it off. I would come up with a good idea why I don't need to do it today. I don't feel like doing it today. I'll do it next week. I mean, the brain has a great way of putting off hard stuff. And you. so I always say one of the time management things is schedule the priorities in your life, put them in your calendar, keep those appointments with yourself. So there's many things that you're gonna think about <clears throat> that are your responsibilities. You just wanna make sure they're in your day planner and you're putting enough time against them so you don't have regrets one day that you wish you had exercised. You wish you had got to your doctor's appointments for your annual checkups. You wish you had eaten right. You wish you had exercised. You wish you had had a better relationship with your kids. You wish that you had paid more attention to your mom and dad. Uh, whatever they are, uh, this, having a good plan and using a good planner and reminding yourself of the things you do care about. Because if you don't, time gets away from you. It'll be Christmas again and uh, it'll just get away from you. I mean, I tell people, in my opinion, you're only four ages. You're born, you're 21, you're 65 and you're dead. So you better get with it and make sure that you don't let another year pass before you get to work on getting better habits uh, and processes for getting your work done, how you do it, your work. At, and by the way, at work, you probably use processes, policies, operating guideline rules. You have a way of doing things. People take better care of their car and they do their life and their body. And people take better care of their job sometimes than they do uh, their, uh, their life. And you certainly, I'm sure we all wanna take care of our car, but we ought to take care of ourselves first. After I retired, my wife gave me three new policy, new, new uh, priorities. She said, Lee, you don't have to do what you used to do at Disney. You don't have to hire them and train them and create a culture. You're retired now. So your new uh, priorities are first take care of yourself so you can take care of us and then take care of your family and th then take care of your business. And then if you have any time left over, you can take a nap. You can go play golf. You can help Kim Kardashian with her problems. But until you get those first three done, don't be messing around. Take care of yourself. And I guarantee you, it will be the re biggest regret you have in your life is when you lose your health. And you could have done something about it and you could have avoided it. And you need to do, take care of your health for not for you, but for your family, for your loved ones. People want you around and you need to not, you need to be selfish. Take care of yourself so you can take care of others. And at work, if you don't feel good and have high energy and take care of yourself, it's stressful. The business you're in is stressful. I tell people, anybody in the country club business, the food and beverage business, the hospitality business, this is like the most stressful business in the world. If you survive that, you can do anything. But you've got to be strong. You've got to get enough sleep. You've got to wake up. you got to, you know, the number one reason, by the way, that people procrastinate and don't do what they should be doing, the number one reason, they don't feel well.
emotionally or physically. And you've got to work on that because it'll help your whole life. You'll feel better. You'll live longer. You'll be a person that people want to be around. You'll be more productive. Uh, there's so many things that happen. You will be a good role model. You will set a good example for your children. You will set a good example for your employees because people, one thing I know for sure, everybody's watching and judging you every day. And uh, you've got to decide what message you're sending. Do you want to send a better message, a stronger message? And um, uh, you got to really think. Thinking is the name of the game. Sit down and think. Am I happy with the way that my life is going? Am I happy with my job? Am I happy with my health? Am I happy with my relationships with people? Am I happy with whatever it is? And then ask yourself, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And you've got to quit sitting around and hoping things get better, wishing things get better, praying that things get better. The only way things are going to get better is for you to get organized, work on the hard stuff, because when you work on the hard stuff, life gets easier. When you, work, when you take the easy route, life gets harder and harder and harder. It's just a cumulative. And you've got to, you've got to either help, have somebody help you with it, talk with you about it, work with you, get a trainer, get a counselor, get a coach, and get on to doing the really stuff that matters in your life. Not just the, I mean, it's not just your job. And so you can think about these things. The other things we have that we learned at Disney is the four guest expectations. If you've read my books, you'll see those in there. Four guest expectations. So we interviewed many guests and found out the number one thing they expect is for you to make them feel special when they come into their business. And I know that's right in the country club business, making the customers feel special, the members feel special. That's really important in your business. They're paying a big membership fee and big prices and, and, and want to be important. And you've got to make sure they feel like they are special and train all your people to show that. Even for the members who are a pain in the neck, <laughs> you've got to make them feel special. You've got to bite your lip and deal with it. Uh, number two, they want to uh, be treated as individuals. And I'm sure you see that in the country clubs day in and day out. I want it my way. I want this. I want that. I want that. Uh, <clears throat> in private clubs, it's always uh, a bigger issue. Uh, although everybody wants to be treated as an individual. I want what I want, and I want it my way, and I, I'm willing to pay for it, and whatever. The third thing, they want to be respected. No matter where they're from, what color they are, what background, what sexual orientation, what religion, um, doesn't matter. Your teams have to show respect to everybody, even if they personally are bigoted or racist. They got to understand from you that this will not be accepted in this business. You do it, you're going to get fired and be right up front with them when you hire people about the expectations for behavior and how they treat people. And uh, you will do this one well. And the last thing the guests want is for you to have your employees trained and developed so they will have a good experience. And those four things make me feel special, treat me as an individual, respect me and have people trained. I'm going to love your place. It's going to be incredible because those four things are, they're going to meet all my needs. And then think about your employees. They want the same thing. You got great employees, make them feel special. Tell them, don't let it, don't keep it to yourself. Treat your employees as individuals when they need a day off because their mother's sick or they have an issue, uh, work with them to treat them as individuals. Because if you haven't had a crisis in your life yet, you're going to. And you wanna make sure that you have a culture and an organization that takes care of people when they're in need and they need to be off for a wedding. Or they, I know these are hard things and employees ask all kinds of requests that are difficult to fill. But we've got to work with them to do that. Treating people as individuals is the best way to get uh, commitment and loyalty and to do a great job for you. The third thing, all employees want to be respected. I don't care what their job is. It doesn't matter if it's the lowest level, or worst paying job to the highest level, to uh, in gender and uh, sexual orientation, all those levels show respect to everybody because all those things are none of your business anyway. It's none of your business what church I go to. It's none of your business what sexual orientation I have. It's not none of your business what color I am or what level of education. The only thing you need to worry about is performance. Can I do the job? That's it. Forget all that other stuff because it's really none of our business. 
And um, <clears throat> that, uh, and last, employees want to be trained and developed. And training and development are two different things, folks. Let me tell you, training is when I teach you how to do something, do. Uh, development is when uh, I have to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one behind closed doors and talk about your attitude, uh, the way you treat people, the inappropriate comments you make, being late to work, uh, not showing interest in your job, being rude to customers. That's development. That's behind the wall. That's behind the door. Uh, training can be 50 people in a room. Development's usually one person, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, in a room, being clear. And let me tell you, it doesn't take but 45 seconds to develop somebody. Somebody's coming to work late, and you see them in the hall, you say, hey, step in my, step in my office, John. Uh, you've been late to work three times this week. Have you noticed that? And when he says, well, yeah, I said, well, let me, uh, is there a reason why? I mean, well, you know, the traffic, uh, no, no. Is there a, a, a serious reason? No. I said, well, okay, John, if that continues, you're going to be terminated. I can't keep you here. Don't let it happen anymore. Do you understand? But I love you. We love having you here. We want you here. You're great when you're here, but you got to be here. That's it. And then let him go. It took you a minute and go let him leave your office go out don't even let him sit down when he comes in just like your mother your mother didn't plan a big meeting to go over your performance <laughs> she didn't have a performance review with you every year she dealt with it when it was right happened right then on the spot when you ran in the street she disciplined you then not later and this is how don't be waiting if somebody's not doing something step over and tell them and they're going to trust you. They're going to respect you. Quit putting off and let, letting one eye, closing one eye when you see something. When people are drinking orange juice in the kitchen and they're not supposed to, you make sure they understand that's the last glass of orange juice they're drinking because it's not part of the policy and it's costing you money. And then if you don't stop it, everybody will be drinking your orange juice and eating your steaks and uh, not coming to work on time and not doing their job properly. So... There's some things, there's a lot more in those books. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you everything because if I told you everything, you wouldn't buy my books. And uh, then my grandkids couldn't go to college. And uh, you know, this is the problem. So uh, I also have something called the Cockrell Academy. It's an online learning system. It's got 10 courses on it now. You can, you can look at www.cockrellacademy.com or my website, leecockrell.com if you wanna learn more about it. And uh, I think I'll stop there and see if I'm supposed to answer questions or Tommy's going to tell me to do something or whatever. But I enjoy being here today. I love talking about this subject. You should love it too, because it's what you do. It's whether you're a parent or a boss or just a person, this is what you do is provide good, strong leadership to people around you. So you get better and they get better. So there you go. That's all I know. Lee? Yeah. Uh, we have time for one question. May I ask one question? Sure. So uh, Disney has uh, um, parks all over the world. Why did, why did Disney, Euro Disney in Paris, why did Euro Disney initially fail? And what did you do specifically to turn it around? And why is it successful today, pre-COVID? I would say the number one reason it failed is because we didn't pay attention to the research of all the research that was done. We, uh, we were told don't charge more than 750 francs for a room and we, uh, we charged more than that. And we, we, everything we did, we didn't serve wine in the parks. We were told we should because the French don't eat without wine. <laughs> and we, it was American arrogance, basically. You talk about leadership. We did not do the things that we should have done that the research told us that the French culture and the European culture wanted. We were gonna shove America down their throat. And right after we opened, we had to change everything because it became clear uh, we were losing a million dollars a day uh, for the first year and for years. And uh, basically had to turn it around, change the policies, procedures, start serving wine, start serving more French food, uh, having people from uh, different countries on the front desk, Germany and Spain, people coming from those countries speak the language. And it just took time. And the other problem is we invested too much, too much debt up front. We they invested $2 billion, probably should have opened slower, smaller and grown like Hong Kong has. But uh, uh, you, the culture, you got you to, gotta, you, you don't change the culture of France. You don't change the culture of China. You got to respect the culture and you've got to deal with it. And in a country club, 
there's cultures in different parts of the country. Certain things are expected in the South or the North or the wherever. If you don't respect the culture, you will get in trouble because uh, people don't give up their culture uh, just because you are the operator. And uh, so understanding people and finding out what they want and then delivering it. Yeah, it's not Thank what you. you want, it's what they want. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Um, Lee, um, thank you. I love you, brother. And I appreciate everything you've done today uh, to, to serve and bless the Florida yeah. Command Association. Um, I learned three things that I'm walking away with. One is there's a difference between training and development. I've never looked at it that way. And you really made that clear that there's a difference between training your people and developing your people. I love your hire them right, train them right, and treat them right. I think we hire them and we train them maybe pretty good, but how we treat them is what makes them stay. And I, I love that. And the last thing I love most importantly is 53 years of marriage to Priscilla and <laughs> still realizing that we have a lot of work to do as being a good husband and being good wives and speaking to our wives wonderfully and, and husbands wonderfully. And I have a lot of work to do in that area. And so thank you for inspiring me there. Well, she says she's going to stay. So I think I'm getting better. <laughs> I want to thank uh, John Weber with Zenith again and Beth Sergeant, my dear friend and the board at Florida Clubman Association for hosting this today. Um, next week is um, part three, a week from today at 10 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time. We're going to have Walt Rakowicz. And I wrote about Walt in the Heart Led Leader. Uh, Walt's on the board of Penn State University, on the board of Merritt Hotels. And he was the CEO of Prologis and probably go down in the top 10 greatest corporate turnarounds in the history of the S&P 500. He took a $20 billion company that dropped down to about 550 million overnight, nearly bankrupt and turned it around to one of the most incredible corporate turnarounds that he did it with love and did it all with heart led leadership. And he's the real deal. So Walt Rakovich next week, um, your password today to get credit is magic. Lee, thank you again so much. Please tell Priscilla we said hello and enjoy your three grandkids and love you, buddy. Yeah, you guys take care, have fun. <laughs> <laughs>